Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 728. For the 18th of September 2022, Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia, a bit overcast, a few rain showers, but not too bad for this time of year. Coming up on this week's show, very much in the news at the moment, the uh, the death of the Queen and the accession to the throne by King Charles, and we start off with predictions supposedly made by Nostradamus himself about the Queen and Prince Charles, or do we reserve the right to be sceptical? Lately, floating around social media are people almost beside themselves, because a book written about Nostradamus happens to mention that in 2022, the Queen would die. Is this a mystical insight? Is this just luck? We suspect the latter, but find out with my report where I look to Snopes to find out what I can about the prophecies of Nostradamus and King Charles III. And speaking of King Charles, we dip back into the archive, the database of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, and try to find out what seers and astrologers and diviners here in Australia had to say about the then Prince Charles in the years 2000 to 2020. Following that, it's the the last sceptical poem by our late friend Jim Wilshire. This one's not such a sceptical poem, but I thought it was a, uh, a fitting poem to round off the series of poems by Jim. And this one talks about um, what he would do if he was a donor. After he died, what would happen to bits of him? It's a funny poem, a bittersweet in a way. Jim Wilshire's sceptical poem or at least poem, The Donor. Then to round off the show, we go back to the Trove Archives, and we read a very, in retrospect, almost comical report about ESP. ESP from the pages of the Australian Woman's Weekly, written decades ago. Now a message from our friends in Victoria, from the Vic Skeptics. Monday the 19th of September, Skeptics Café. They have a magician, Joe Klein. And the talk will be magical objects animating artifacts through the genre of bizarre magic storytelling. Now you can join in with the Victorian skeptics for that talk no matter where you are in the world. And for more information on that upcoming talk, why don't you head for vicskeptics.wordpress.com. And just before we start the show, a quick birthday shout out to the one and only Skeptical Fairy Godmother Angel from the internet. Happy birthday. I think I met her once on a train. Hmm. But now it's time for me to run downstairs. Run downstairs. What, 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 what will I have this week? What will I have this week? Crumpets. Crumpets with honey. Mmm. However, I notice here in Australia, in the Audi supermarkets, they're selling, as they do every September, their Oktoberfest range of goodies, including my fatal weakness, peanut puffs. I'll think about peanut puffs. I'll lead a hot crumpet while you listen to The Skeptic Zone. have here in my hands a copy of the book The Mask of Nostradamus, a biography of the world's most famous prophet by James Randi. To Richard Saunders, with thanks for his contributions to the skeptical world, James Randi, September the 5th, 2007. It's lovely, lovely little uh, souvenir I have here from James Randi, but the book itself is a fascinating read. It really is. Randy went to uh, great, 
great lengths to research properly Nostradamus, his claims, his quatrains, the age in which Nostradamus lived, the uh, original French in which the quatrains were written, and I can really recommend this book. It's, uh, I, I think I've read it at least twice, and it is a fascinating and enlightening read. Now, I bring this up because in the last ooh, last week, on various social media outlets, notably TikTok, and there's been some on Facebook, people have been claiming that uh, Nostradamus predicted the current situation we find ourselves in, the events of the last couple of weeks. In other words, the, uh, the death of Queen Elizabeth. Here are some examples taken from social media. My goodness, has Nostradamus once again predicted something correctly and accurately? <gasps> Nostradamus predicted that King Charles will abdicate and unexpected mystery king will take his place. If we have a look over here, there is the, the document. 16th century um, astrologer and seer Nostradamus is pretty famous for his predictions. But right after the Queen of England passed away and her son King Charles took over the throne, Nostradamus' certain prediction is now surfacing. An author and leading expert on Nostradamus, Maria Reading, has suggested that the seer predicted the exact year of the Queen's death in cryptic poems written in 1555. Guys, so this book is mad. It tells you literally what's going to happen every year. Mad, mad, mad. And it was actually written in 2006. Watch this. If you go to year 2022, succession to the UK throne, and then guess what happens after that? Abdication of Charles III of England. So it says he's going to be removed after that. Let's have a look. Page 112. Prediction. The future King Charles III and his princess consort, the former Camilla Parker Bowles, will be... Uh, will find themselves faced with a constitutional crisis on the death of Charles's mother, Queen Elizabeth II. The crisis will be provoked by the Church of England, which is traditionally headed by the monarch. Did you know in 2006 there was a book by Mario Redding called Nostradamus that predicts the Queen's death in 2022? Now, it can be debated whether this is Nostradamus' real words, but this book is very real, and you can find it. Does this prove we all live in a simulation? Is this one big scripted video game? Now, of course, it goes without saying that um, this is simply not the case, but it's worth diving a little deeper into this. And we end up looking at a good overview at Snopes, at snopes.com. And this was published on the 15th of September, and I'll read some of this out. Did Nostradamus predict Charles would abdicate, leave Harry the throne? Claiming 16th century French astrologer Nostradamus predicted various world events is a never-ending pastime for some. And this is a piece by Bethania Palmer. The claim is, Nostradamus predicted that Queen Elizabeth II would die in 2022 and King Charles III would abdicate, leaving the throne to Prince Harry. And the rating in the Snopes? False. Fact check. In the wake of the passing of Queen Elizabeth II on September the 8th, 2002, various hoaxes and misinformation circulated online. These included a misleading claim that the supposed source of many a prophecy, Nostradamus, foresaw the year Elizabeth would die and that her heir, King Charles III, would abdicate leaving an unexpected royal on the throne. It goes on to say Nostradamus is best known in the modern era for being trotted out during global news events, with enthusiasts claiming he predicted them with uncanny accuracy. Nostradamus was falsely credited with predicting September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks in the US, for example, and also the 2003 Columbia Space Shuttle disaster. In the case of misinformation spreading in September 2022, not only did some claim he predicted with accuracy the year Elizabeth would die, but also he foresaw the crowning of Prince Harry as king. Neither is true, as we'll explain. 
A shocking new interpretation of the prophecies of Nostradamus says that King Charles' reign could be very short. Bombshell suggestion Prince Harry could take the throne, reported the UK tabloid The Daily Star. Meanwhile, many shared on social media a screenshot from a book from 2005, Nostradamus, The Complete Prophecies of the Future, by British author Mario Redding. And the page of the uh, the book says... Prediction. This quatrain will come as no surprise to the British people, as it has wide implications. The first is that Queen Elizabeth will die circa 2022 at the age of around 96, five years short of her mother's term of life. Prince Charles will be crowned in her stead and become king of the islands. The implication here being he is no longer king of the other regions of the world over which his mother reigned, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., which will have, in the interim, become republics. Prince Charles will be 74 years old in 2022 when he takes over the throne, but the resentments held against him by certain proportion of the British population following his divorce from Diana, Princess of Wales, still persists. The pressure on him is so great and his age is so much against him that Charles agrees to abdicate in favour of his son. The question is, which son? For in the last line, Nostradamus makes it clear that, quote, a man will replace him who never expected to be king, end quote. Does this mean that Prince William, who would have expected to succeed his father, is no longer in the picture? And that Prince Harry, by process of default, becomes king in his stead? That would make him King Henry the Ninth, aged just 38. We point to the words new interpretation in the Daily Star's article because it's the operative phrase. The source of the rumour is simply Redding's interpretation of material written by Nostradamus as seen in the screenshot from the book above. Nostradamus made no predictions specific to British royalty in 2022. It goes on later in the article to say Reading claimed Nostradamus, quote, makes it very clear, end quote, that the man to replace Charles will be an unexpected one. Reading guesses that William won't take the throne for whatever reason, and that the next in line would be Harry. This was all speculation, however. Reading included the writing of Nostradamus, called a quatrain, at the top of his chapter. But Nostradamus' writing is vague and makes no mention of a specific country or ruler. Now, I won't uh, read the French because I'm not very good at French, but the English translation says, Because they disapprove of his divorce, a man who later they consider unworthy, the people will force out the king of the islands. A man will replace him who never expected to be king. Because the actual writing of Nostradamus is vague, we cannot say that Nostradamus predicted the circumstances around Elizabeth's death. And we can hardly say he foresaw events that haven't yet happened, or may well never happen. At the very best, we can say that British author Mario Redding accurately guessed the year that Queen Elizabeth would die. A note of context, Europe's kings and queens during the life of Nostradamus were contextually very different than the UK's modern royals. If King Charles III abdicates, it wouldn't exactly spark a bloody power grab, as illustrated by the gory HBO series Game of Thrones, which is loosely based on medieval power struggles. Modern day Royalty in the UK is more of a formality than an actual seat of power. It would be an intrigue, no doubt, but would probably have little consequence in the daily lives of UK citizens. And as far as I can tell, looking around, it is a lucky guess by this author, predicting the year the Queen would die. However, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago on the Skeptic's Own podcast, or even was it last week, when we read out the uh, predictions concerning Queen Elizabeth II over a 20-year period here in Australia, people predicted that Queen would either die or abdicate in about seven different years, including 2025. Indeed, just to recap what I wrote in a little paragraph, which is uh, actually in the latest issue of the Skeptic magazine as well, Queen Elizabeth was a favourite of the psychics in the database, the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, with a total of 26 
predictions concerning the late monarch. However, of the 26 predictions made, we marked none as being correct outright. 22 were wrong, 3 were expected events, and 1 was too vague. According to the seers, astrologers, and diviners of the future, the Queen was either to die or abdicate in 2004, 2010, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2025. Towards the end of his book, The Mask of Nostradamus, Randy writes, There will always be those who will point to some quatrain I have not treated in this book, and jeer that the prophetic powers of Nostradamus are proven in that instance. Let them consult the same sources I have and come to their own conclusions, which will probably not change in any case. An historian of France in 1682 provided an appropriate epitaph for our subject in his review of the year 1566. This year there died that trifler, so famous throughout the world, Michel Nostradamus, who boasted while he lived that he knew he could foretell future events by the influence of the stars, in whose name afterwards many ingenuous men have put forth their imaginings. I cannot improve upon that comment, says James Randi. So if you happen to come across on social media or elsewhere the current story that Nostradamus predicted the death of the, uh, the Queen, point them to Snopes. And I encourage you to get yourself a copy of uh, The Mask of Nostradamus by James Randi if you're interested in Nostradamus at all. Once again, it's a fascinating read. I sure do miss going to those sceptical meetings in pubs and cafes to hear talks and interact with my friends. Oh well. <coughs> I think I can help you with that. Who the hell are you? I'm your sceptical fairy godmother angel from the internet. You're my sceptical go- what? Relax Richard. I can make your wish come true. What? You mean, free beer? No, no, no. The other wish. Oh, oh, really? Yes! I have news of sceptical meetings and talks online. Oh, oh, oh yes, of course, yes. Skeptics Cafe Online by the Vic Skeptics brings you live and interactive sceptical talks via Zoom. Anyone... Anywhere in the world is welcome to join in on the third Monday of the month. Just check out the Skeptics Cafe page on Facebook to see when the next talk is and who will be presenting. Alternatively, see the Vic Skeptics website at vicskeptics.wordpress.com for details. That sounds great, a sceptical god, fairy, um, uh, angel, mother, um, person... uh... And... There are similar sceptical online talks happening around the country and all over the world. All you need to do is search for them. Wow. Now, just one more question. Yes? What about the beer? (sighs) Okay. All right. Well, just for you. I'll make it so you can go to the supermarket, buy whatever beer you like, and drink it while watching the talk online at home. (laughs) And they say miracles never happen. And to think I gave up being the tooth fairy for this. What? Nothing. Goodbye. Last week on the Skeptic Zone podcast, we brought you a list of psychic predictions made from the years 2000 to the year 2020, found in the database of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. And these projects uh, involved or concerned the late Queen Elizabeth II. We discovered 
of the uh, predictions made, we marked none as being correct outright. This week I thought we'd uh, scan the database again, interrogate I think is the right word, and look at predictions concerning the then Prince Charles. Since the events of last week, I've been tweaking the database, bringing it up to date, because now we know certain things we certainly didn't know a few weeks ago. And during this exercise, I'll be referring to King Charles as Prince Charles, because all the psychic predictions are spoken of him as Prince Charles, which he was at the time. We discover we have 24 predictions made about Prince Charles. We've marked 17 as wrong, only two correct, which we will get to. We've got two predictions marked too vague, two are unknown, couldn't get to the bottom of them, and one prediction is marked as expected. So roughly in percentage terms, we've got uh, something in the order of 70% of the predictions are wrong, with only about 8% being correct, which more or less falls in line with the overall uh, results of the entire project. But let's take a look at some of these predictions made about Prince Charles. And we'll start way back in the year 2000. Well, actually, it's 1999 in the pages of the uh, Women's Day magazine, Athena Starwoman, predicting for the year 2000 and 2001, Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles to marry in 2000 or 2001. Well, of course, they did marry, but it wasn't until 2005. The next year, Anne Anne, also writing in Woman's Day magazine, predicts, I don't feel Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles can afford to take that final step into marriage unless the monarchy is no longer in place. The Queen fears such a union will destroy the crown. Camilla loves Charles enough to wait an eternity for him, and probably already has. Of course, self-evidently, those uh, predictions amounted to nothing. In the next year, Anne Anne, also writing in Woman's Day, predicted Prince Charles will have another riding accident. Falling from a horse, he'll be advised to quit or risk permanent back or neck damage. And we could find no such accident happening to Prince Charles in the year 2002. And then also in 2002, Kerry Culkin's writing about Prince Charles, and this is one of the only correct predictions, Prince Charles to marry Camilla Parker Bowles. That's it. No date, no prediction of when. And we might say, well, that was the general feeling of the time. It's hardly a surprise. We could almost get away by marking that as expected, but we decided to say, well, it's a correct prediction, so it was marked as correct. And Kerry Culkins the next year also predicted a right royal scandal will emerge concerning successor to the English throne. Now, this is a bit vague. However, we did find some uh, issues in the year 2003. We've got aid of Prince Charles. So one of his aides was involved in the scandal, which I don't recall off the top of my head that what that was. And also we've got listed here in the notes, gifts for cash. So we decided that there was something going on in 2003, so we marked that prediction as correct. Although, once again, you could argue it's it's a bit vague. A right royal scandal will emerge with, with no details, but nevertheless. In 2004, Princess Lyara, or Liara, in Woman's Day, wrote, Prince Charles' future as king is not bright. Fresh anti-royal feelings flare, and the future of the monarchy is assessed. I see his year being marked by despair and depression. He may even come to accept that he will never be king. And we've simply marked that as uh, being wrong. We couldn't see no reports relating to that at the time. And she also predicted there is nothing to suggest Charles and Camilla will marry. So it makes another point about the psychic predictions in general. You've got some people predicting one thing, some people predicting another in a toss of the coin situation. Well, one of these things is going to uh, occur 
And then when it occurs, the people who said it will occur can say, look, it's a psychic prediction, I was right. Or if something doesn't occur, people who said that can say, look, it's a psychic prediction, and I was right. In 2005, Kathy O'Brien wrote in The Centralian Advocate, Prince Charles will be confronted by a protester when he visits Alice Springs in March. And we scoured newspaper reports, and we couldn't find any time the prince was confronted by a protester, although it must be said that it's expected that um, at, even at the time, and probably even now, especially now if the the now king does a tour every now and then, he'll be confronted by protesters. That's something we can just expect to see. In 2006, Abbey Rose, writing in the Sunday Herald Victoria, in Victoria wrote, Charles will be dogged with rumours about him being gay, which is why he married Camilla. And we've written no credible reports on this situation could be found. In 2013, Mitchell Coombs, commenting on the morning show, the television show, said Prince Charles would be bypassed and William becomes king if it came to that decision. And, of course... It didn't happen, and it makes no sense anyway. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work that way. In 2018, Georgina Walker, writing in the New Idea magazine, wrote, Charles and Camilla, a crown will be placed on Charles. Camilla will be seen wearing a tiara with pink tonings. I see the number 99 flash up. This could be days, weeks, or September 9, or similar. I hear... She, the Queen, has stepped down. I sense the Queen has always thought Charles was risky business and held back this opportunity to govern. He will not be popular with many in government due to his views around environmental issues. He will gain a reputation as the King that rocked the foundations of political circles. Well, nothing like that occurred in 2018. So we've had to mark that as wrong. And people might say, well, the date of September the 9th is mentioned, but the prediction is clear that uh, Georgina Walker is talking about abdication. And as it happened, the Queen uh, died on September the 8th. But again, it doesn't talk about death. It talks about abdication. And the rest of the prediction about uh, he will gain a reputation as the king that rocked the foundations of political circles. It's yet to be seen. Harry T, on an appearance on the Today television show in 2018. Prince Charles, not meant to be king. Crown will go to William. Charles will have a short reign. Which doesn't make too much sense. And I guess the only way that would be correct is if Charles does not have a long reign which is yet to be seen. But the, the line here, crown will go to William, well, in due course, that is entirely expected to happen. Julie McKenzie, uh, commenting on her own YouTube channel, in 2019, Prince Charles, short reign in 2019 or mid-2020. Well, that didn't happen. In 2020, Georgina Walker, writing in New Idea magazine, the monarchy has been significantly reshaped. Prince Charles' time to be king will be brought forward. Which, I, I, I can't quite make sense of that. But in 2020, the Queen did not die or abdicate. And finally, we have Julie McKenzie again on her YouTube channel in 2020. His Royal Highness Prince Charles will be revealed. He knew more about Epstein scandals. And we could find no reports indicating that. So there we are. And that was just some of the predictions made about Prince Charles in the uh, archive of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. And dare I say, I think a lot of them are predictable, simply talking about the succession and the uh, marriage of uh, Prince Charles to Camilla Parker Bowles, which was, I guess we could say, on the cards at the time. What does the future hold for King Charles III? Well, 
I guess we'll all have to wait and find out. Dr. Harriet Hall, MD, known to thousands as the Skeptoc, a retired family physician and former Air Force flight surgeon. She writes about medicine, so-called complementary and alternative medicine, science, quackery and critical thinking. Harriet now has a free course, a series of 10 video lectures on science-based medicine and alternative medicine. The videos and an accompanying course guide can be found by following the link at skeptoc.info or by visiting web.randy.org slash educational dash modules dot html. Topics covered in the series are science-based medicine versus evidence-based medicine, what is CAM, chiropractic, acupuncture, homeopathy, naturopathy and herbal medicine, energy medicine, miscellaneous alternatives, pitfalls in research, and science-based medicine in the media and politics. Harriet covers each topic in a matter-of-fact, no-nonsense way that's sure to educate and entertain. Skepdoc.info The donor. I've decided to be radical and join the growing donor list. Tick the box on my organ which states what won't be missed should the worst happen to me and I pass away my cares. I donate my driver's licence to someone who's lost theirs. Maybe I could extend it to many other things which I own. If something happens to me, they can transplant my phone. Or even my old computer, should I be slipped a mortal slap can be passed on to the family of some poor chipless chap. If I should fall victim to some dark and malignant rumour, then I bequeath my laughing bits and my sense of humour to anyone who can use them and set the laha half to free. And for anyone who needs it, I'll donate my instant repartee. Once again, to go back to those archives at Trove, at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the National Library of Australia, supported, no doubt, by the Australian government, full to overflowing of digitised newspapers and so on. What an important asset this is. Our history, as told in the pages of publications going back to the 1800s. And only uh, the other week I was searching through some Canadian newspapers and I found a reference from my father to my father, who, it is reported here on Friday the 10th of January 1969 in a Manitoba newspaper and under the heading of Faulkner News. It's reported, a Christmas concert on Sunday evening, December 22nd, was held at Grahamdale United Church with a nice crowd in attendance. Reverend Saunders showed a Christmas film which was enjoyed by all and a tasty lunch was served. What a find, what a find. It's a pity my parents aren't here anymore. I'm sure they would have got a, a laugh out of seeing that reference all those years ago. But you never know what you're going to find when you search for uh, references and things in the digital archives of newspapers from around the world. But today, we're back in Australia, and our search term is one we've had before, about a year or so back on the Skeptic Zone, but it's worth revisiting, of course. It's that old-fashioned term you don't hear much anymore. It's sort of been consigned to the history books somewhat. The term is ESP, Extra Sensory Perception. 
which is a very popular term in the 60s and the 70s. So we turn to the pages, and it's only one reference this week, we turn to the pages of the Australian Women's Weekly, dated July 23, 1980. And the story is called, What's Happening in ESP Today? It's, um, it's a little bit strange because uh, it says, What's Happening in ESP Today? Question mark. But it's, um, it's, it's, I guess it's a question, but it's a statement as well. It reads better as a statement. What's happening in ESP today? Statement. Instead of, what's happening in ESP today? Question mark. Hmm. Make of that what you will. Here's the story. It goes over three pages in this magazine, or really two pages. One page is sort of split up. Psychic research was long ago taken from the world of fiction and is the subject of a serious scientific investigation. Dr. Charles Osborne, a senior physics lecturer at Caulfield Institute of Technology, has been delving into the phenomenon of ESP since 1977, three years before this was written. All right. The world of the psychic researcher is very different from that depicted in the media. It is not a world of things that go bump in the night, or people with superhuman powers. Well, let me stop right there and say that's exactly what they're trying to determine, whether people have superhuman powers. If somebody was psychic, I guess you'd have to regard them as superhuman, but if, if they were truly psychic, then that would simply be a natural ability, then they wouldn't be superhuman. Hmm. I digress. Rather, most of the research is as routine as in other areas of science. So, what is happening in ESP? Uh, now, that makes more sense as a question. Telepathy. This is the oldest experimental area of psychic research, and gone are the days when subjects were expected to experiment with cards using various symbols. The modern work in this field, which started with Gertrude Schmeidler, Charles Onerton, Rex Stanford, and others, concentrates on what is called free response general extrasensory perception, GESP, experiments, and covers the areas of telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and retrocognition. In these experiments, the targets chosen for the subjects include music, emotions, drawing, and sensations. In the past three months, I have been conducting an experiment involving the use of hypnosis to produce a heightening of telepathy. One of the targets used was a drawing of a giant fly standing over a house. The subject was required to try to send a mental picture of the drawing to another subject by means of telepathy. When the sender saw the drawing, she gave a grimace, and it was quite obvious that she disliked it. And when the experiment was completed, the person receiving the drawing said even though she did not get the target fully correct, she knew that it was a distasteful object. Well, there you go. Proof positive. The major breakthroughs in the telepathy research have occurred in the use of what are called altered states of consciousness, ASC. It has been known for a long time that if you float in a warm bath, put a flannel over your eyes and let your ears lie beneath the water level, then after a short time you'll find that you start to daydream. What a shock. In modern experiments, there are three methods of producing such states. Hypnosis, drugs, or Gansfield. The Gansfield is a variant of the bathtub. But this time, the eyes are covered with ping-pong ball halves and the ears covered with earphones. The subject is seated in a comfortable chair and a warm pink or white light shines on her face so that she loses the sense of sight temporarily. And radio static, comfortable level, is played through the earphones. The subject is then told through the earphones to talk about what she sees in the mind. 
In one recent U.S. experiment, a female subject reported that she was floating over a landscape and she could see the name of a nightclub in Manhattan. Then the scene changed to a nightclub marquee in Las Vegas. The target was seven photographs of a building and nightclubs in Las Vegas. My work shows similar visual imaging. The important point about these experiments is that they can be done with any person. Subjects do not have to be specially gifted. Research into telepathy in adults shows what we always knew, that there is telepathy when emotion is involved. Work on ESP in children has produced some extremely interesting results. It shows that telepathy is extremely strong in the very young, especially if we use targets that are recognizable. For example, four-year-olds will do well when we use jelly beans or chocolates, and nine-year-olds will do well on targets which they make up themselves. Boys do well if we use footballs, spiders, dogs, guns, and other objects associated with boys, while girls like pictures of pop stars, dresses, horses, and swap cards. Oh yes, 1980. Results show that telepathy seems to be strongest between friends when they are nine years old and are inconsistent when they reach ten. If the children have strong beliefs in the possibility of telepathy, then they will succeed, whereas if they are told it is impossible, then it will not work. Oh, I would have loved to have seen the uh, protocols for those tests. Out-of-body experiences. This is an area where an interesting breakthrough has occurred in the past few years. One of the problems has always been whether the person actually leaves his or her body when they experience a place outside their physical selves. The types of experience which have been investigated range from brief experiences when subjects appear to be hovering a few centimeters above their bodies, detailed experiences of pulling out of the physical body in much the same way as you peel out of rubber washing gloves, and moving into adjoining rooms, seeing events taking place in that room, and returning after some time to re-enter the physical body in as vivid a manner as was involved in leaving it. Some people say this type of experience is nothing more than hallucination. However, there are a number of cases in which subjects having these experiences find themselves in a remote location and obtain accurate information about it. The more interesting cases occur when such subjects find themselves in a remote location and a second person physically at the location experiences their presence. Carl Ossus questioned persons who were able to have out-of-body experiences to describe how they viewed objects. It appears, it appears that they see them as they would if floating above the objects. However, it could be simply that ESP is involved and the person does not leave his body. Recently, Robert Morris of the University of California at Santa Barbara worked with Stuart Harari, who is able to have voluntary control over his out-of-body experiences. They used human, animal, and physical detectors in a remote location to see if they could detect Harari. Morris also asked Harari to obtain information about a remote location, and Morris tried to see if there were any body changes. The results were fascinating. Some humans in adjacent rooms reacted to Harari's presence. However, much more work has to be done to determine consistency. The receivers were told to talk when they felt Harari's presence. When it comes to animals, rats and snakes did not respond, but a small kitten always became extremely quiet at the times that Harari felt that he was in the room where the cat was situated. As the animal got older, it responded less frequently. Now, that's an experiment I could have been part of. Why not? As regards to the ability of Harari to detect parts of the environment, there were some interesting but inconclusive results. The only body changes that were recorded were changes in heart rate and respiration. 
In my work, I have found that training of subjects with inconsistent out-of-body experiences has had some success. A person who has had out-of-body experiences should try to recreate, in a game situation, the conditions which led to the previous experience. More than 80% of participants have been reactivated and all have reported that the technique is extremely helpful. A recent survey by Dean Shields of the University of Wisconsin has found that out-of-body experiences occur in about 90% of the world's cultures, so it is probable that the experience is common. Well, if Dean Shields of the University of Wisconsin did find that, he should have received his Nobel Prize some time ago. We read on. However, one surprise is that the silver cord idea, which is the soul, is attached to the body by a cord during the experience, is only reported in one of 67 different cultures, the British American culture, which may mean the cord idea is a reflection of belief rather than being a reality. Oh, you are so close to being on the right track there. A reflection of belief rather than being a reality. Psychokinesis. This ability, it is a statement here, this ability, as it's like a foregone conclusion. <clears throat> this ability of humans to influence objects by mental processes attracts the most attention. 1980. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago when this was written that um, spoon bending was a thing. We have all read of objects floating across the room as if on a string. So what is the real situation? Helmut Schmidt of the Mind Science Foundation in San Antonio, Texas, has designed a machine which consists of a set of flashing lights arranged in a circle. The lights are controlled by a device which produces electronic signals which light the lights. If psychokinesis were not present, the lights would blink on and off sometimes clockwise and sometimes anti-clockwise, or uh, counterclockwise. I think it's also known as, depending on where you are in the world. It was found that some people could will the movement of the lights in a clockwise motion. Now, since the machine is out of the experimenter's control, here we see technology working in a field regarded as traditionally anti-technological. No discussion of modern experimentation would be complete without reference to using a computer. The following experiment has been repeated a number of times. A list of words which are paired are given to a subject to memorize. After three minutes, the task is changed to adding up numbers. Then after this, the subject is asked to repeat the pairs as best they can. In the meantime, the computer has generated all possible pairs from the list so that there are 100 possible combinations. I hope you're keeping up. A number of groups have found that the pairs that are most remembered are those that occur most often on the computer printout, which means the computer was influenced by the mind. Uh-huh. Well, that's quite a um, bold conclusion. Recent experiments have been performed in which Mongolian gerbils, a small rodent, will run in a cage which is like an endless treadmill. They had their speed increased by psychokinesis. Really? Well, that would be uh, great if you could do that at the, uh, the uh, horse racing track. In another experiment, knife fish, which are related to electric eels, had their movements altered again by psychokinesis, because the fish work out their movements using their electric signals. Oh, here we go, here we go. Next heading. Metal bending. This is an area that has caused a deal of heartburn. After all, what is more useless than deforming metal by gentle stroking? <laughs> John Hasted of Beerbeck College has taken the experiments to a much greater level of sophistication and has designed a key which has miniature devices called strain gauges inside the key. The subjects are not allowed to touch the key and the degree of bending is measured by the strain gauges. In my work, I have used hypnosis to produce a state where the subject thinks that he cannot exert any physical strength. 
This is tested with a hand grip test, and then the bending is commenced. I have found no real differences occur. Related work has shown that subjects can change the temperature reading of a thermometer even when it is in a glass of water which has a constant temperature. Again, I would have loved to have been there to see these tests conducted. Reincarnation. It is common, especially in India, for children to claim they have lived before and can remember details of a previous life. Dr. Ian Stevenson of the University of Virginia has studied 1,700 cases since 1961. In a large number of cases, Stevenson found that the subject had heard details from perfectly natural sources and had stored the information in the subconscious. However, after eliminating such cases, Stevenson is left with unexplained cases. And I'll just stop here briefly to say that... uh, Every word at the end of the sentences in this column is sort of wrapped around the scan, if you know what I mean. So some words are cut off. So it's a a little tricky to read, but we'll continue. The method used to investigate such cases is very simple. Interviews are held and questions are asked about where the person supposedly lived, how old they were when they died, and what were the special features of the claimed memories. The most interesting results in the work show that if the subject lives in a city, then the previous life will be in a city. The age of the subject will be less than, and I think it's 10, because there's a 1 printed and the following character is hidden, so it's probably 10. The age of the subject will be less than 10, and about half the previous lives ended violently, and ages at death are usually greater than 30 years old. There are accounts where, under hypnotic regression, people claim to experience previous lives. The method used by the hypnotist is to tell the person to search out other lives and other places, and the subjects are led on their journey. There is very little control on giving the person's hints, and the follow-up investigation is usually non-existent. And it concludes, What of the future? In Australia... There is a need for centralized testing laboratories and more testing of children. People who have had psychic experiences should contact the Caulfield Institute of Technology, 900 Dandenong Road, P.O. Box 197, Caulfield East, 3145. Isn't that interesting? The last tiny paragraph talks about the future, which is now the past. And... uh, We could save that guy a lot of time if we could go back in time, but that's not how time works and that's not how the gaining of knowledge works. Now, I had a quick look around for Charles Osborne and I did find another reference to him at roughly the same era from the Bulletin magazine dated the 6th of April 1982 in an article by Philip Adams about um, the Bent Spoon Award where he talks about various nominations for the Bent Spoon that year and a paragraph here says finally it's the academic section where a strange alchemy turns the taxpayers money into arrant nonsense let us introduce the three contenders beginning with Dr. Charles Osborne of the Caulfield Institute of Technology. Year in, year out, Osborne lectures on his experiments with telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, and the 40 psychic kids he claims to have located in Melbourne. Osborne always seems to be about to publish his results, yet will not allow independent testing of his subjects and their claimed ability to bend metal by psychic means. And I could find little else on this character, so I really don't know what the ultimate story was there. So there you are. Way back in 1980, this was published as more or less a report about what's going on in ESP. And that report, written in the pages of the Australian Women's Weekly in 1980, was not long at all before... 
James Randi flew out to Australia to conduct his uh, water divining tests, which more or less led to the formation of Australian Skeptics. Yes, I would love to have a time machine to travel back to 1980 to be part of all that. But you don't need a time machine to enjoy all the articles available at your fingertips when you visit Trove. That's T-R-O-V-E dot N-L-A dot G-O-V dot A-U. And you never know what psychic experiments you might find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone, and thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal, payments at skepticzone.tv. Some people chip in a little bit, some people chip in a bit more, and some people are very generous indeed, and enable me to keep the show going and buy very nice uh, recording equipment, hopefully, hopefully, to bring you a more entertaining show. Now here's something to look forward to. Uh, Soon, I hope, I'm working on a report put together by our reporter in uh, Canada, Adrian Hill, with the help of our reporter in Victoria, Michelle Bickersma, and our dear friend Kelly Burke over in the United States. Of course, all of these three people are teachers, either current teachers or former teachers. So they've put together a very interesting report, which I will... uh, make into segments about uh, teaching. Again, I won't give away too much. What I think I'll do is I will think I'll have that spread over a number of weeks and also put it up as a, uh, a special on the Skeptic Zone's YouTube page. But stay tuned for more information about that coming up uh, maybe even as early as next week, but pretty soon anyway. And my sincere thanks to Adrian, Michelle and Kelly for taking the time to... Uh, Team up and record that segment internationally. And as I've said many times before on The Skeptic Zone, I have enormous respect for teachers. They go through a lot. They really do. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter, at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Hello to the people who listen after the music. Uh, We're going to play the dice game this week. I have a four-sided die, a D4. One, two, three, or four. This is where I roll the die and you use whatever powers you like. Getting my Skeptic Zone pen ready to write down the results to predict what number will come up. You've got a one in four chance. Sorry, Susan. This is, uh, this die has not got a five on it. Hmm. Anyway, roll number one. Here it is. Three. Okay. And roll number two coming up. Four. Final roll coming up. Two. Well, there you go. I mean, there's only four numbers to choose from. Today's or this week's numbers are three, four, and two.